Ladies, thank you all so much. You know, if I was a wizard, if I was a wizard, I think the last name I would choose for myself would be Simon. Now, that's not to say that Simon's a bad name, but when you think about a wizard, they're supposed to have some kind of a strange, mysterious, and exotic name. Something like Merlin, Gandalf, or Rasputin. But alas, the Simon in today's scripture from Acts, he didn't have a say in the name he was given at birth. But he did have a say in the profession that he chose for himself. He was a wizard, a magician, a sorcerer, and a darn good one at that. For many years, Simon had developed quite the following in Samaria because of the amazing things he was able to do. The Bible says that Simon practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. This was a man well-versed in the art of manipulation, with using sinful forces and abilities to inspire rabid devotion from the people, people who were hungry and clamoring for glimpses of divine glory. In fact, so enamored were the people with Simon that many called him the great power of God. Now, I've never been a wizard, a king, or a celebrity, but I imagine it must be nice to have, hold a unique position among your people, to be someone looked up to, admired, and worshipped. Well, sure, that sounds really great, doesn't it? But here's the thing. No matter how devoted your fans and followers might be, when they find something more powerful and more real to obsess over, they're going to stop giving you their money. They're going to stop worshiping the ground you walk on. And before you know it, they're going to forget you even exist. Such was the dilemma of Simon. For years, he had mesmerized the Samaritans with his magic. That was until a man named Philip came along preaching good news that the people could hardly believe. Of course, we know that good news to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as Philip preached this good news among the Samaritans, the people left their old gods in the dust and they placed their faith in Christ. Not even Simon himself could help but be amazed by what Philip was doing. He'd never heard preaching like this before. He'd never seen the signs and wonders, the the kind of which accompanied Philip's ministry. Drawn to Philip's side by the strength of his preaching and the, the power of these signs and wonders, Simon came to faith in Christ. But all the while, Simon remained focused on the outward demonstrations of faith being performed by Philip while he also neglected the inner transformation which had yet to take place within his own life. Because of that, Simon's faith wasn't really fully mature yet. It was jilted. It was off-center. And because of that, Simon viewed his faith really around these two questions. What can I get out of this faith for myself? And how can I get the kind of power that Philip has? When Simon stopped to consider the tricks up his sleeve in comparison to the tricks being performed by Philip, he knew that he no longer measured up. And because of that, he was no longer satisfied with who he was or with what he had. You know, just like Simon, we too can find ourselves dissatisfied and disillusioned at times, especially when we compare our lives against the lives of others. But whether you're a sorcerer or a saint, we all face dissatisfaction on a daily basis, don't we? But instead of seeking satisfaction through acquiring the gifts and talents that others possess, today we're going to spend our time focusing on how we can be satisfied with who we are. Now returning to the world of Samaria, two of the apostles, Peter and John, They've arrived on the scene to support Philip's missionary work. But as they arrive, they realize that these new believers hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet. 
so to help these new converts reach the full potential of their faith, Peter and John prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit. And after laying their hands on the people, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Now, it's impossible for us to know exactly what it looked like for these believers to receive the Holy Spirit. But whatever it looked like, it got Simon's attention. Watching with bated breath, he witnessed these newcomers arrive and do something that not even Philip had done. From Simon's perspective, Peter and John possessed power beyond his wildest dreams. And by just the touch of their hands, they were able to share that power with others. Now to a fellow pilgrim waiting to receive the Holy Spirit, this scene would have brought excitement and anticipation. But to Simon, it invited a very different response. The Bible says that when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said this, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Friends, I can't think of a more ignorant response to seeing the Spirit of God at work than by offering God's servants money to learn their tricks. But alas, that's how Simon willingly and enthusiastically chose to respond. As a professional magician, Simon was thinking about how much money he can make with power like this. And thinking Peter and John to be peddlers of power like himself, Simon offers these two apostles money in exchange for the power that they possess. You see, while Simon had been drawn to the faith because of powerful preaching as well as signs and wonders, he'd been more consumed by the methods than the message. If only he had opened his ears and his heart in addition to his eyes, Simon would have understood that the power which brought about forgiveness, faith, and miracles, it couldn't be controlled by human hands, and it couldn't be bought with human money. The power that this man witnessed was a power that the, that the apostles themselves couldn't possess, and it certainly couldn't be possessed by some self-seeking charlatan from Samaria. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, that the Spirit of God distributes gifts and abilities to each person as he sees fit. In addition, Jesus himself testifies in John chapter 3, verse 8, that the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Friends, the Spirit of God cannot be bought, manipulated, or controlled. To believe in a spirit that's born, sorry, to believe otherwise is to believe in a spirit that's born of man, not of God. Such a spirit wouldn't be able to save people from their sins and raise them to life everlasting. On the contrary, a spirit robbed of its divine authority and independence would rip people from the gates of heaven and drag them down into the depths of an inescapable hell. Upon receiving this re offer to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter immediately understood the danger of such a request. And because of that, he didn't pull any punches when responding to Simon. Listen again to Peter's response as listed here in the message paraphrase. To hell with your money and you along with it. Well, that's unthinkable, trying to buy God's gift. You'll never be part of what God is doing by striking bargains and offering bribes. Change your ways and now. Ask the master to forgive you for trying to use God to make money. I can see that this is an old habit with you. You reek with money lust. Simon's dissatisfaction was his stumbling block. He yearned to have something that he didn't possess. He wanted to buy something that he couldn't own. As a person new to the faith, he had fixated on the wrong things in the wrong way. And because of that, 
he was now heading down a path that was leading him further and further away from God. Sadly, this passage from Acts doesn't resolve Simon's dilemma for us. And because of that, we leave Samaria unsure of whether or not Simon was able to wake up and realize that he was seeking satisfaction in the wrong things before it was too late. Now, transitioning from the time of the early church to now, we can be thankful that Simon's ambiguous outcome doesn't have to be our own. We don't have to be blinded by ambition, greed, and dissatisfaction. Instead, we can faithfully accept that God has already given us everything we need in order to be satisfied with who we are. But fair warning, accepting this truth really isn't all that easy. That's because we live in a day and age where contentment, satisfaction, and happiness are all defined by what we do, what we have, and who we want to be. Don't like your job? Well, just quit it and get another one. Not satisfied with what you have? Just buy whatever it is that will make you happy. Not satisfied with who you are? Just get one of those cheap magazines at the grocery store that will teach you how to be a new and better person with little to no effort. You see, like Simon the wizard, wizard, we're transfixed by the things we don't have. And we'll do, buy, or change whatever we can, even ourselves, in order to get them. All in the pursuit of satisfaction. Now friends, there's nothing wrong with pursuing satisfaction in this life. But when you go pursuing, looking for satisfaction in the wrong things, things that rust, decay, and corrupt, you'll soon find yourself repeating these words from Ecclesiastes 1. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Why do you think that is? Well, it's really quite simple. We'll never be satisfied with who we are or what we have until we are first satisfied with Jesus. Every person in the world wants to know what will make them happy. We're all looking for the person, place, or thing that will meet our expectations, our needs, and our wants. Now, why do you think we're all born with these longings and desires? Well, it's because our sinfulness has separated us from the very thing which we need the most. And friends, that's a relationship with God. From the cradle to the grave, we spend our lives seeking meaning, purpose, and satisfaction. But I'm here to tell you, we'll never be able to find those things apart from a life-giving, soul-saving relationship with God. Unfortunately, our sins, regardless of how simple or significant they may be, they they make such a relationship with God impossible. And because of that, Many of us spend our lives drifting further and further away from the source of our life, our strength, and our satisfaction. You know, if that's where our story ended today, we'd have no hope or satisfaction to look forward to. But thankfully, today and every day, we've got some good news to share. That's because God's never been in the business of pushing people away from himself. If anything, God works each and every day to draw you closer and closer to his side, whether you realize it or not. And you know what that work that he's doing? It's already finished. It was completed when Jesus Christ came into our messy world in order to fix our broken relationships with God by dying and rising for you and for me. Romans chapter 4 verse 25 says that he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Friends, you'll never be satisfied with who you are until you are first satisfied with who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Jesus Christ loves you so much, in fact, that he left his home in glory to suffer and die for your sins so that you wouldn't have to. He did for you what you could never do for yourself. And he did all that and even more because he wants you to share in his victory. 
to receive the forgiveness that he's won by defeating death and hell. And not only that, he wants, you to, ra- he wants to raise you to life everlasting so that you won't have to endure the suffering and separation that he's already endured for us. That's who Jesus is. A chain breaker, a lifesaver, and a satisfier for our souls. Now, if that's not enough for you, here's something else for you to consider as well. To know that we are satisfied with Jesus is to know that Jesus is satisfied with us. To know that we are satisfied with Jesus is to know that Jesus is satisfied with us. Friends, once once we are covered by the blood of Jesus, it doesn't matter who we are, what gifts we possess, what we look like, or really anything else. Once we are covered by that blood of forgiveness, mercy, and grace, we are forever enough for Him. Instead of feeding our insecurities about who we are, what we have, or what we do, Jesus is satisfied with who we are and the gifts, resources, and talents that we humbly lay at His feet. And He's satisfied because there's a place for everybody in His kingdom. As we're reminded in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So if you don't have the gifts and abilities that someone else has, don't worry about it. Jesus is satisfied with the gifts and abilities that you do have. Not satisfied if you don't look like other people. Don't worry about it. Jesus thinks you're beautiful just the way you are. And if you're worried that you don't think you're worthy of God's love, just remember how much Jesus gave up so that he could know you, so that you could know him. Friends, this world is full of people who can't get no satisfaction. And that's because we keep looking for it in the wrong people, places, and things. Today, it's my hope and prayer that you'll find your satisfaction in Jesus Christ. That you'll find everlasting contentment and peace through who He is and through who you are in Him. As we close, may this reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, serve as our benediction. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Amen. Today our invitation is to receive the satisfaction that comes through knowing Christ and by finding your identity in him. As we prepare to sing our closing hymn, I'd rather have Jesus Consider what you'd rather have other than the satisfaction of God's love for you and your love for God. Hopefully that list doesn't exist. Hopefully it's a very small one if it does. But nothing in this world, riches, glory, power, and fame, nothing can satisfy the longings and desires of your souls like Jesus can. So if you have yet to place your faith in Jesus, It's my hope and prayer that you might do so today. And if that's that's a decision you're willing and ready to make today, I'll be down front during our closing hymn. I invite you to come down front so we can celebrate that decision with you. Or if God's leading it on your heart today to join together, uh, to join this body of believers at Forest Hills, I invite you to come down during the same time too so that we can welcome you into this family of faith. But no matter how the Lord is leading you to respond, let us all now stand and sing our final hymn. I'd rather have Jesus.